little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the South Bronx. I grew up in the poorest congressional district in the United States. Where? Where exactly? Uh, I believe it's District 12. Um, what neighborhood is that? Um, it is... God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the actual borders were, but it was 172nd Street and Vice Avenue. Um, that was the last tenement we lived in that burned down before... Actually, that building's still standing. That's the crazy thing. Before we moved into the housing projects. And before that, my mother and I had moved around quite a bit, and there was just this advancing wave of arson fires, you know. I mean, it was, it was a pretty obvious situation. I mean, the manufacturing base had fallen out of New York. Was this in the 1970s? This is the 1970s. Um, I mean, this is when I was a very small child into, you know, my sort of preteens. And, um, you know, you couldn't raise rent on people because there were no jobs. A lot of the buildings were vacant. A lot of the area had, you know, people had either moved to the suburbs or had moved out of the area altogether and left the state. A lot of the knitting factory jobs went down south. Um, it wasn't even all overseas stuff. It was just a real realignment on the eastern seaboard. And the Bronx, which was a place that had a lot of warehouses, a lot of sort of, you know, factories that really depended on people making things by hand, that disappeared. Um, I mean, a, a lot of people like to b blame the building of the Cross Bronx Expressway. That didn't help. That was certainly a huge destruction to the old Tremont neighborhood. But there were other forces that just accelerated that. And, you know, you combine that with the shutting down of firehouses and then, you know, a bunch of absentee landlords who would rather, you know, have a building fall apart or burn it in order to collect the insurance because they can't rent it. So you have this you know, these people in the way, which was people like my mother and myself, you know, moving from building to building. And I remember my mother telling me when we moved into the housing projects, which is the West Farm housing projects, which is right on Tremont Avenue, actually. Um, right, it's, it's the block north of the Cross Bronx Expressway, which was kind of the dividing line at that point. She said, you know, these fires are gonna come and just wipe everything out around us. And she was right, it, the buildings, Next to our housing project, the building right next to it, to the north of it, burned down. And that kept going all the way up to, practically to Fordham Road, along Keith Plaza and those neighborhoods and Mapes. And, uh, you know, it was really something to see. I mean, it was, um, you would hear all these insane things in the newspapers, you know, in the New York Post and the Daily News. People are burning their own buildings down. It's, it's insane. Who would do that? How does that impact your psyche like when you look back now like how do you think that it was a crazy time you know when you're a kid and you don't have a, f a frame of reference it's really odd um when we lived uh, in that last tenement before we moved to the housing projects it was interesting you know i've talked to other friends of mine who you know grew up more or less you know the, in the same areas it's interesting you, you talk to people that aren't if you look at their photo albums there's a bunch of pictures in the 60s and then suddenly there's no photographs or the photographs are very much in, in the home. There's no like photographs of the neighborhood until the late 80s again. And it's something I, I, I really sort of consciously noticed when I, when I was at my friend Eloy's house, who's a kid I grew up with. He's a man now, he's got you know, a couple of kids. But I, I kept noticing this weird, it's like if you looked at a sedimentary layer you know, and it's like there's like a black, like this is where the asteroid hit. You know, it's like that's that's how people dealt with it. They decided to not document it or, or to document their lives in a very different way, in a very controlled way that had none of these empty lots, burning buildings as a backdrop. I mean, when I, when I used to go, I went to CS50 um, through third grade. And I lived only about four blocks away, but in between our building, which was one of the last populated buildings in the area, was this just blocks and blocks of empty, bombed out buildings, just glass on the street. And I remember, you know, because I was a kid and, you know, my mother, you know, raised me in a particular way, I would wait for the street light. There was no traffic. I mean, there was no traffic for days. Occasionally, you know, a cop car would like roll by, but that was it. And I would wait, and I remember being able to hear, it was so quiet in, in New York, if you can imagine this, the, uh, the green switcher boxes that are sort of piggybacked on the street lights, 
They're, they're gone now, but they used to be these like, big steel boxes. You could actually hear them counting off until the light would change. And I would walk all my way to school, and it just... It wasn't until... It wasn't until like I started seeing it in movies that, I, that it started to look weird to me, which is a crazy thing. There was a motion picture called Wolfen uh, that literally had a tracking up shot that almost led up to my building. It cuts right off before it like covers Charlotte, Boone, Jennings, all those streets. Just before it gets to Vice, it cuts off. And I was watching that with a girl who I was taking. It was like the first time I'd ever taken that girl on like a real date. We were watching that movie and um, I was at a private school at the time, you know, and I, I sat there just like shrinking watching this tracking shot because she had no idea. She's like looking at this thing like it's some great piece of crazy science fiction, but it was the neighborhood I went home to every night after going to school on the Upper West Side. Um, it would, they, were, they were really strange times, you know. I mean, Koch was the mayor, you know, and it was just fascinating and disgusting is the only way I could, I could describe it because there was never enough money for education or for housing or for jobs. But as soon as graffiti artists started to cover the trains top to bottom, there was suddenly $40 million dollars to you know, shore up the train yards and get dogs and all this stuff. And it's like, where did that money come from? You know, it's like, it, it came from the inspiration born of an embarrassment. You know, those trains would go downtown and suddenly these like invisible people living in these bombed out areas, you know, Brooklyn was in horrible shape during that time as well, Bushwick areas like that. And that's where all those artists came from, oddly enough. Um, a lot of them were white kids too, which a lot of people don't know, like Zephyr, and, uh, Scene. A lot of the guys I like really worshipped turned out to be like these white kids from like Allerton and these other neighborhoods that were just like on the outskirts uh, of uh, where we grew up. I remember seeing Sane Smith like in some of the most amazing places on the subway, up along, all along the subway, like the one line of mm -hmm. the ground. And and above ground, he, he was ubiquitous. It was an incredible time, you know, because there were a... Somehow, you know, with no political manifesto, no nothing, this culture of kids, I mean, they were kids, decided that they weren't going to remain invisible. Um, and, you know, people can dismiss it as self-promotion or whatever. But it's interesting that all those guys wound up in advertising, too, pretty much. So, so now, like all the, all the, um, all the methods that people use to like cover trains, like you see it now in the service of like cable TV, like the History Channel, like literally bombs a train now, like when they do a new show. If you ride the shuttle in Midtown, the entire inside of the car, in the way you know, like two or three kids would have done with a bunch of markers, it's covered top to bottom. Like you can't escape it. So it's interesting that this like thing that was just like so disgusting to people is just, it's, it's marketing practice now.